So we might have a different view on what, what a good criteria is to get a good response. So we update the criteria if we need to. And then we say to it, now based on this updated cr criteria, I want you to aim for a 10 out of 10. Hello everyone, this is Dan Fitzpatrick, the AI educator. When I am talking with schools and colleges, universities, at conferences, with businesses, one of the first questions I always ask is, how many people have used a tool like ChatGPT or Google Gemini? There's always still a few people who've never used it, and every now and then, still a few people who've not heard of it yet. Then I ask, who's using it on a daily basis and, and getting results from it? Who's finding that it's having an impact on their workload, for example. Not many hands go up. And there's a huge gulf there between the amount of people who've used it and the amount of people who are using it regularly. Now that fascinates me because we're dealing with probably one of the most advanced technologies in the world that has the lowest barrier of entry. So you don't need any real special skills. You just need to know how to talk to it or write to it. So what is going on there? Well, I think it is because a lot of people try it and then a lot of people think, well, actually the result isn't as good as I thought. So maybe this, these tools are just a bit overhyped because I'm not getting amazing results from it. And that's a really fair point. So we need to learn how to communicate with this thing a bit more. So the quality of the input dictates the quality of the output. And the key to that tends to be the key to having a good conversation with a colleague, uh, with someone you're coaching, maybe an intern, for example, that you have to use those communication skills in a similar way with a tool like ChatGPT. The teacher in me back in 2022 straight away went to the idea, well, I need some kind of framework. And so I developed the PrEP framework, prompt, role, explicit instructions, and parameters, which I still think is really important. And it has helped teachers all around the world. It was featured in my book, and I, and I like to talk about it when I'm given workshops. I have recently, just before Christmas, added three more parts to that framework because of some recent research that has been done on, on effective prompting of these tools. So it's become the prepare framework. And I just want to touch on this today. The prep framework, without the AR and E at the end, is still really important. However, it keeps the conversation with AI transactional. And let me tell you why, because the first P of prep is, is prompt. So you, you're introducing the AI to what you want it to do. So let's say you are creating a lesson on the 2008 Sichuan earthquake. And you say to it, right, we're going to create a lesson on the 2008 Sichuan earthquake. That's the very first point of entry into that conversation. Now, some people only go that far and you will soon run into a lot of problems. After you've seen it creating all of its magic and writing it all and the kind of the shine wears off and the wow factor when you first see ChatGPT kicking into action wears off, you will soon then, as a teacher, start looking through and thinking, actually, it's not specific to, to me, my students, and you're probably gonna have to spend a lot of time editing it and I think teachers look at something like that and think, well, I may as well just do it myself or adapt something I already have. I think out of pretty much every profession, teachers have the best bullshit filter. And what I mean by bullshit filter is if they say that something's going to take a bit of effort and, not, and they're not going to get much return for it, it goes to the back of the queue. Teachers are amazing at, at prioritising. How do we dive straight into a tool like this and start getting results straight away? Well, the prep framework, starting with prompt, Secondly, role. Now, it always sounds funny, a bit strange when I, when, I, when I mention this to people for the first time. But if you tell it to become a role, it will really try to do that. And that's because a tool like ChatGPT tries to please. It tries to do what you're asking it to do. In fact, it's trained like that. It's trained to get digital rewards so that it, every time it does something, that's good. So it wants to please. It wants to do that for you. Not all chatbots are like that, though. If you take Pi, for example, Pi, P-I dot A-I is a website you can go to by Inflection AI. And that's more designed to understand to the point of maybe empathy as, as that's their goal. So it doesn't necessarily try to please that type of AI. It more tries to, to understand by asking more questions. Chat GPT will tend to try and please by getting you the answer, getting what you need as fast as possible. So giving it a role, let's say, let's take the Sichuan earthquake lesson plan for an example. If you tell it you are an expert on the causes and effects of earthquakes, you've got a PhD, uh, in this from Oxford University. You were also um, amazing at being able to design engaging learning experiences for 13 year olds. What it will do is that you're just giving it a different angle to try and access the information that you need it to access and so it can become more specific for you. If you think of this like a filter, 
Okay, so we're at the top of the filter with the first P prompt. We're a bit further down with roll, and we're slowly, slowly, slowly trying to get this language model, this AI, to focus on what we need it to focus on. Because when it gets focused and when it's clear, then that's when we start to get really good results from it. And it's all about us staying in charge, taking control. Especially as teachers, we're going to want to remain as much in control of this as possible. In fact, I named one of the chapters of, of my book, the, the bestseller, The AI Classroom, outsource your doing, not your thinking, because you want to be the main thinking agent as you use this tool. Now, that isn't always going to be the case. There was a study done last year out of America which found that ChatGPT can be better than a group of humans for generating ideas. So if you want to take the guardrails off it and get it to think outside the box and, and be a bit of a sparring partner with idea generation, by all means, um, you don't have to be as in control. But if we wanted to create resources, for example, or we want to train a chatbot to specifically do something or to help a group of students in a certain area, we're going to really want to remain in charge of the thinking and get it to do the doing for us. So the next stage in this, so we've got the prompt, we've got the role, is explicit instructions. And this is really an umbrella uh, category here where you just get everything in there you needed to know. So the pedagogy, the pedagogical side, what you're used to doing pedagogically, maybe the pedagogical approaches that your school, college, university um, takes, uh, the information about the... The, let's say if it's a lesson plan about the lesson plan, how long is it? Is it a 60 minute lesson? What type of activities do you normally do? Do you want your tasks based on a certain type of taxonomy? And so on and so on. You know, I'm a big believer that as teachers, you know three things. And that is your pedagogical approach. You're an expert at that. That is your subject. You're an expert at that. And thirdly, that is the students in front of you. And you're an expert at dealing with them and their needs. So you still need to bring that to the table when communicating with a tool like ChatGPT. Just as a caveat, we don't want to give it personal information about students, but we can give generalized information that might help it create resource, lesson plans, whatever it is, a chatbot that will help that specific group of students. So we've got prompt, we've got role, we've got explicit instructions. And the last P is parameters. Now this again is a bit of a catch-all for things like the tone of voice you want it to take, the reading age uh, of the text that it produces, it could be the, some of the formatting, do you want it to write in a table, do you want it to write with head, um, headings and subheadings, do you want it to write concisely, the free version of ChatGPT can ten tends to waffle on a bit and write a bit too much, do you want it to be concise, you need to tell it. So that's prep, you're essentially saying to it, do this, be this, do it like this, give it to me. It's very transactional. And that will get you so far, but it won't get you amazing results. It's, it's the start. What's going to get you better and better results and make the response that you get from the prep model 10 times better is then turning that conversation from the transactional to the collaborative. Turning it from the transactional to the conversational turning it from the transactional to being crystal clear. And that happens through conversation, just like it does with humans. We become more aware of what, what each other are saying in a conversation, don't we? We become clear on somebody's angle on a subject the more we talk to them and the more we dig down. So we need to turn this into a conversation that is collaborative and that is very clear. Those three things. How do we do it? Well, I've added three more things onto that framework. So we've got the prompt, the role, the explicit instructions, the parameters, and then the A is ask. And this is really simple, but effective. You simply say to a tool like ChatGPT, once it's given you that response, ask me some questions that will help you write a better response. So you're putting the onus back onto the AI to go, right, have a look at what you've written. And now I want you to improve it, identify what, what you don't know, what's not clear, and then ask me some questions. And I normally say, write them in concise bullet points for me because I don't want to be reading lots of paragraphs of different questions. I just want to know, bang, 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 bang. Okay, I'll choose to answer some of those questions. And then we've entered a true back and forth conversation and I can help it produce better responses. Then, in a similar vein, the R. So after the A, we've got the R, which is rate. You asking a tool like ChatGPT, to then do some really deep reflection and evaluation by saying to it, 
What would you rate your response on a scale of one to 10? Present the criteria to me in a table that will show me what you've based this rating on. And that's going to, you're demanding it becomes um, reflective. You're demanding that it evaluates its own work. It's almost like being a coach with a coachee. And so it will do that for you. And then it gives you a great insight into, well, actually, do I want that criteria? Is what I mean by a good response the same as that criteria? So we might have a different view on what, what a good criteria is to get a good response. So we update the criteria if we need to. And then we say to it, now based on this updated cr criteria, I want you to aim for a 10 out of 10. In fact, I want you to go for a 20 out of 10 and get it to go for it. And again, it's built into it to want to please. to what You up the stakes and it will try and meet that. Last one, the last E is emotions. Appeal to its emotions. Does it have emotions? Absolutely not. You say to it, in fact, the research paper that this is based on said that the a phrase that, that seems to work best is a phrase like, my job depends on this, give me the best response you've got. Okay, so you can say that, you up the stakes, it realises this is important, so it tries to please even more. And this report found that they got a 10% on average better response from ChatGPT by just adding that in. Now, there are loads of other tips to put in your framework uh, to turn it from the transactional into the conversational, collaborative, and making it clear. Um, one question I get regularly is, if I be kind to it, if I praise it, will it help it? In fact, that the research paper that I'm referencing has found that that is not the case. Um, you can say things like take a deep breath, pause before it goes on and, and answers the question. Uh, that's been proved to help a little bit as well. Um, this is changing all the time. So this isn't an exact science. We're not dealing with, with something that is a science here. We're dealing with something that's a bit like having a conversation with someone. And so involves digging deep, uh, trying to stay clear, and a, a level of understanding, really, and a level of wanting to commit to doing it better. Now, if this sounds like a lot of work just to get it to do a resource for you, it might be the first few times you do it, okay? So I know that bullshit detector is kicking in right now, but save your prompts. What I used to do quite a bit was I'd have a Google Doc open. If I, if I got to a, a point where a prompt was working really well for me, copy and paste it in the Google document and use it. Now, because ChatGPT has a history panel, I normally just go and get it from, from the, the history of that conversation. Try it out. Go from the transactional to the conversational and see how much better it will work for you. It's just one of the quirks of these systems. But see how it works. Let me know. Give me your feedback and... Enjoy your prompting.